I gotta update my stream. Hey guys, so we're live. Let me just fix a couple of housekeeping items here before we get started. So, in this live stream, we're gonna be going over. Let me do a sound test real quick. So, in this live stream, we're. Okay, we sound good. All right, so what we're gonna be going over is there's been a lot of talk about the X670 chipset. Is it worth it? You know, I think part of the reason why a lot of people are not adopting the new platform at launch, specifically, there's multiple reasons. One of them, obviously, is the platform cost. So these motherboards are very expensive. Uh, the other day, AMD did do their Meet the Experts webinar, and they did introduce the B650 and B650E uh, chipset and the different motherboards from all the different uh, motherboard manufacturers that we're going to talk about here in a little bit, but uh, they did introduce that, and I do think that those are going to be a lot more uh, budget-friendly. So in terms of affordability, I think that's going to be kind of the sweet spot in terms of early adopters. <laughs> Ray Smith, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for the sub. Much appreciated. <laughs> so... Yeah, but for, for today's stream, specifically we're going to be focusing on X670E um, and what it offers in terms of connectivity, expandability, and how, how relevant it'll be long term. Because I really do think that despite the fact that these motherboards are very expensive initially, I do think that they are going to have a pretty long runway in terms of relevancy. I do think that their their segment in the market is it's it's kind of like amd is trying to sort of flex the mainstream platform and kind of overlap it into the hedt uh market so if you're on like a really old uh, i think the target audience for this platform really and I, I feel like the marketing team at amd probably should take more advantage of this in terms of the messaging but I do think that rather than kind of market this to gamers and content creators, I do think that anybody who is on an existing, you know, either X99 or X299, or even like first gen Threadripper, so X399, I do think that you can see a lot of benefit uh, with going or upgrading to one of these modern platforms, specifically the X670E. Because I do think that, as we'll show here in the block diagrams, uh, which is basically what the majority of the stream is going to cover. It's basically block diagrams in terms of the various different motherboards. Um, because a lot of that information, for some reason, uh, Asus in particular, as well as MSI, have not done a very good job in terms of uh, breaking down or actually showing in the user manual how the chipset is actually laid out on these boards. So, Which is kind of absurd when you think about it, because... This one that I'm showing here is the ROG Crosshair X670E Extreme. So this one is their flagship motherboard. And as you can see, you know, the only way the only way that uh, you have access to this is it's impossible to have access to this. You basically have to do what I did here and basically draw it out yourself to kind of figure out what connects where. And even then, like this diagram, I tried to make it as accurate as possible. Um, it's I, I do think that there's still some errors or there's still some things that I don't know or prob is probably incorrect or inaccurate. So it is kind of uh, my own understanding of, of just reading through the user's manual um, and the documentation that's available to the end user to try to figure out what connects where. Um, but currently, you know, this is kind of what it is. Like, unfortunately, that is what we have. Um, I do also have the... Let me bring that one up. Where is it? MSI Ace, there it is. So I do have the MSI Ace, where is it? Okay, so I do have this one as well. Let me just kind of fix the image here so that people can see it. And let me just move it down here. So yeah, I, I did do the Ace uh, mainly because, whoops, the Ace the Ace was the motherboard that I wanted at launch, but I couldn't get it for some reason. Like, it wasn't available at 
the local micro center. And if you check Newegg, it's on back order. So they probably sold out really, really fast. But I, I do think that this one, yes, it's expensive. It's like a 700 or I mean, Micro Center has it listed for $7.99, but Newegg has it listed for $6.99. I think it's $6.99. I haven't looked at MSI's official website in a while to see. Uh, but I had to kind of break this out in, on my own. Like, there's no... You can't find this info in the manual, unfortunately. So the only way to really understand what connects where is to really draw it out on paper or just draw it out like the way I've done it here in Paint. Uh, which is kind of absurd, but if we look at the ASUS one, so this is the extreme from ASUS. This wait, why do why is there two of these? Okay, wait, do I still have that one? Okay, so I still have the ASUS. Right, good. Yeah, so the the extreme is an interesting one. This one took me a long time to figure out what connects where. And even then, I don't think this is 100% accurate, guys. So you're just going to have to trust me on the way I have it laid out. I could be wrong. Um, there are some things that are still a mystery to me in terms of how this motherboard actually works and what they're doing with the resources because it's really, really interesting. You know, the thing about the... I guess we'll go over the extreme first because I think a lot of people... ASUS being the largest one, um, I think that there's going to be a lot of interest in this one. Um, I don't think they're going to sell a whole lot of these, to be honest, because this is a $1,000 motherboard. So it is their flagship. Um, but, you know, it's hopefully this will help some people that are considering it to try to figure out resource sharing because I was looking at different comments on various forums and different videos on the reviews and people were asking you know questions about like well uh if i'm if i want to run you know like four if i want to run like two two m.2s pci gen 5 in a raid zero you know which which drives should i or which which m.2 slots should i connect them in so that i'm not bottlenecking the system or it's like i'm getting the correct performance and there's a lot of weird stuff with this board it's really really interesting overall in terms of uh like what it's what it actually has so let me go ahead and I want to see if I can, well, they don't really do a good job of letting me just kind of, I guess I'll just have to do, I'll have to use snippet to get the, uh, let me see if I can just grab it. Let me see if this is going to freeze my camera, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. So let me just copy that and just throw it here. I'm just going to like shrink it down. And just kind of leave it there in the corner so we have this for reference and then i'll do the same thing for the msi x670 e ace the ace really is my favorite one out of all of them but as time goes by i am starting to like the uh the extreme it's starting to appeal to me more and more let me grab that one as well, and I'll put that on this one. So those who join the stream later on, they won't be uh, completely lost. So let me just go ahead and there. Okay. So yeah, let's go over the extreme real quick in terms of connectivity. Let me get, let me pull up the manual on this motherboard so we can kind of walk through it. So yeah, and if you guys are watching and you have a comment, feel free to just comment in in the YouTube chat and just, just let me know like if you have any questions on any of this stuff. So, okay. I've got the manual pulled up. So this is the Crosshair Extreme X670E. This is the flagship from Asus. This is as far as I know, this is the second most expensive AMD AM5 based motherboard on the market. The most expensive one is the MSI Godlike. And I think the only reason why that one is priced at $1,300 uh, is because as far as I know, last time I checked, they removed the SLI license. Uh, but originally, the Godlike did list SLI support making it the only AM5 motherboard that actually has the NVIDIA license key to to enable SLI and NVLink. So 
I don't know if that's the reason why it's commanding such a premium. I did check their website recently and it, it doesn't show up that they support SLI anymore on that mo motherboard. So I don't know what happened. Um, if they did remove support at the last second, I think they kind of shot themselves in the foot because uh, I think that that would have been really the only key differentiating factor uh, over the ROG Extreme to make it kind of, you know, worth it to an Extreme enthusiast that still wanted to kind of do like SLI uh, 3090s or something. But anyway, so we're going to go over the Extreme now. So the first thing about it is, as you can see here, it has the AM5 uh, CPU LGA 1718. So what's interesting to note about X670E is that it is actually using daisy chained B650 chipsets. So the promontory, well, I guess I shouldn't call them B650 because B650 uh, is what defines whether or not it is a single based uh, chipset. The chipset is actually promontory 21. Um, so those who had first gen Ryzen and actually dug into it, uh, you know, a couple years ago, you would have known that the name of the, what used to be the Southbridge, or, or in this case, the chipset was called Promontory. That's always been the name of the AMD, AMD's chipsets from Zen 1 up until now. So what we have on the current generation or this new stuff is the Promontory 21. I don't know where the number comes in. The 21 uh, doesn't make sense to me because technically this would be like Promontory, uh, what, 5? Well, let's see, X370, 470, 570. Now this would actually be Promontory 4. So I'm not really sure where the numbering's coming from, but anyway, it's called Promontory 21. That is the chipset. X670 and X670E consist of two of those. So there's a primary in the middle shown here. So let me go ahead and get my, uh, let me just kind of mark on this. So uh, let me do this so that I can annotate. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I'll just mark in blue. So that is the primary chipset that uh, you can kind of think of it almost like a north bridge, to be honest. And then the second one down here, the secondary one is kind of like the south bridge. So it's very interesting. It, it, it almost harkens back to the olden days of like 15 years ago when, you know, AM2 or AM1 um, or, or, you know, even like if you go even further back, you know, socket 939. Uh, in those days, the way the CPU was set up, and this also does apply to Intel as well. Uh, they did have a north bridge and a south bridge. So the north bridge was kind of your interface to the CPU socket. And the north bridge kind of controlled all your uh, protocol signaling. So things like PCI, AGP, uh, the, uh, the, it was kind of the root hub for all the different peripherals. And then the south bridge was for your IO. So, you know, that's where SATA typically would reside, uh, USB, uh, PETA, the, the parallel, the DB9 connector, all those sort of things. As far as I know, they were all Southbridge based. I could be wrong. It's been a very, very long time since I've actually dealt with a traditional Northbridge, Southbridge setup. So that was actually my very, very first computer build, like way back when I was still a kid. You know, it was a Northbridge, Southbridge, AMD, socket 939 based system. Um, and then from there I went to AM3, and then I went to Intel, I went to Haswell, and then I went to Ryzen, and here we are today. So well, that's kind of a little bit of history on uh, my history with uh, motherboards and computing and desktop and DIY. Um, but, you know, anyway, so moving on, if we look at the extreme, it's really convoluted and a little bit confusing to people that are interested in buying it because they don't really know, like, what M.2, like, does it support four M.2s? Are they, are they all PCI Gen 5 or how many are Gen 5 and how many are Gen 4. So that's kind of what we're going to go over today. So the first thing that we should all know, uh, and there is a really good article. Actually, I'm going to copy this image, see if I can copy it into the picture here. Let me actually ex extend this out. And we'll add this because this will be very, very important for what we're going to go over in a little bit. So let me kind of shrink that down. Oh, that made it look bad. All right, well, we'll just keep it native sized. How about that? We're gonna use that as a illustration for the CPU. 
And then we're going to use this. And, and this is all credit to Tech Power Up. Tech Power Up is a really good uh, website. Now this one I will have to shrink down. Let me try to, try to keep it from going really, eh, it looks really bad now. Eh. That's still kind of readable. I don't know, how, how does that look on stream? That does look pretty terrible. Um, yeah, let, let's, uh, is there a way for me to fix this? Well, uh, we'll just go with that for now. And I know I'm in the way, but all that says is, is PCI, uh, Gen 2 USB. Eh, we have to cover up the Asus picture. All right, we'll do that. We'll just put it up here. Okay. Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand, and, and props to Tech Power Up, uh, the Law Swede but at, on Tech Power Up posted a really, really good article. I recommend everybody go and read this article. Uh, all you got to do is search, either go to techpowerup.com or uh, you can type in Tech Power Up uh, AMD Zen 4 and Socket AM5 Explained. This is the best article by far. It's even better than AMD's own website in terms of explaining uh, the CPU lanes and the chipset lanes and how they're all mapped out. So really, really good article in terms of making sense of this. And if it wasn't for their article, I would not have been able to draw out the, the block diagram like this. So I wouldn't have been able to make sense of it. So, so this is a very good... Uh, I guess legend or key to figure out what connects where. Um, so if we look at the on the tech power up images here, so the bottom one is the AM5 CPU. So you can see that the CPU allows uh, 20, well, total of 28 lanes of PCI Gen 5. So we've got, I need to get back to the brush. So we have the first one here. This first group is going to be typically wired to the GPU. So this is your X16 PCI Gen 5 slot on the top of the motherboard. Then you have what they call a general purpose set of an additional eight lanes. Uh, one of them typically is supposed to be wired to an M.2 drive. So this one is typically going to be an M.2 drive. And the second one, which is also considered general purpose, this is up to the motherboard manufacturer to decide what they want to kind of connect there. You know, there's there's a lot of different options. I think in the article it references three typical use cases for this. One of them being a, well, there's actually more like four, four potential options. So one of them could be another M.2 drive. So you could get a second PCI Gen 5 M.2 uh, by four. Another option could be to connect a Thunderbolt or USB 4 controller. Uh, you know, so uh, potentially the the Intel or the Asmedia USB 4. So Intel does have the Thunderbolt 4 controller, which does support USB 4. Um, and then Asmedia also has their own USB 4 uh, controller. So both of those uh, wire up four PCI lanes. So you could connect that up to this. It is worth noting that I think Intel, the actual spec is PCI Gen 3 for Thunderbolt 4. So what that means is that you they don't have to connect the Intel controller to the that set of PCI 5 lanes. And if I'm not mistaken, when I worked it all out and drew it here on the board, I ended up not uh, I ended up com concluding that the Intel controller on the uh, the Crosshair Extreme, is actually connected to the PCI Gen 3 bus on the primary chipset. It could also be the secondary chipset, but I think it's on the primary chipset. So that's kind of what I concluded, although I, I don't know if that's ideal because that controller has two USB 4 ports on it on the back of the motherboard. And I do think those are spec for like up to 40 gig. And you know, that's two of them together is 80 gig going through there I uh, on a PCI 3 bus I uh, you know your maximum throughput might be limited so maybe it is connected to an X4 on the Gen 5 bus 
I did also consider maybe it was on the Gen 4 bus. But, you know, that doesn't make sense for this motherboard because this motherboard does have uh, a... It does have a PCI uh, X4 4.0 slot at the bottom of the motherboard. So, I kind of figured that it's probably not connected there. Um, the thing that really was throwing me off... Originally, I was thinking that the Thunderbolt controller was probably up here. Uh, but then, where would the second Gen 5... Uh, SSD go because you know that's they they tout that there's two of them one of them is on that gen z.2 underscore one which is what I actually think it's wired to uh, right here and then the other one the other gen z one connects via the chipset as a gen 4 so yeah I'm not really sure it's it's a real big mystery to me um, I really do think that the easiest way for us to get the answer is if Asus were to update the manual to include that connection, just to show and illustrate for everybody uh, what actually, how it's actually wired. Because you know, it's a one thousand dollar motherboard. It's kind of prosumer. It's borderline HDT in terms of connectivity and feature set. So, uh, you know, the fact that it's not in the manual. You know, hint, hint, wink, Asus, come on. Uh, you know, I'd like to see the block diagram actually published so I don't have to do a lot of guesswork like this. Um, but I did do this just to help, kind of help the people who either already purchased the Extreme and are probably wondering how it's actually laid out and wired up, uh, or even those who are potentially looking at getting one, um, myself included. So, so this is kind of the current... My current understanding of how I think the Crosshair Extreme is wired. So if we look at this, so based off of the manual, you've got two, two X16 slots mechanically, um, but they're wired. So you have the first one can be either X16 or uh, X8. And if it's X8, then you know your second one is going to be enabled at X8. So you can run two of them in X8. So if you want to do like Crossfire or multi-GPU, you can't do SLI because this motherboard doesn't support it. Uh, but you can do Crossfire, although it's kind of pointless at this point. Uh, more than likely, what I see people doing is running a, uh, a 4x4 self-bifurcated or maybe a bifurcated card um, in this slot for uh, two drives each by 4 because you do have 8 lanes and then they'll have the GPU running at by 8 in the primary slot. Uh, and that still leaves you with an, a second M.2. The only problem with this motherboard, I would say the one negative aspect of the Extreme from Asus is that there is a lot of sharing of resources going on. There's a lot of switches. There's a kind of like, they have some kind of magic way that they're getting six SATA ports because when I did the math, it didn't add up. Like, I don't know where those last two SATA ports are actually connected. I think there has to be an as media uh, controller somewhere on the board, but I don't really know what it connects to because there's no there's no open lane on any of the PCIe three slots. They're all used up, so I really don't know where it goes. Um, but anyway, you can see here you've got from from the definition right. You have the GPU slot, so that's your X16. You have a general purpose set, so this one is wired for your first M.2. So this is the M2 underscore one, so that's this one. And then you have a free one, which they did wire to another M.2 Gen 5 slot. That's gonna be that Gen Z 2.1 or 2 underscore one. So, so you are able to run a RAID 0 using all of these lanes. Um, using combining the first m.2 with the first gen z m.2 if that makes sense and those two together are capable of pci gen 5 without using any kind of resource lane sharing and that sort of thing so the the second m.2 does cause you to run your graphics card slot at x8 and also does cause the second uh, mechanical pci 16 slot to run at by four so it is worth mentioning, if you do put a second drive in the M22, you're going to be running your graphics card at by 8 
and you're going to chop down the second slot to a by four. So we got to do the math. You got to make sure that it all adds up based off of the available interfaces to the CPU. So that, that takes care of all the general purpose PCI 5 lanes. The only remaining PCI 5 lanes are the four that go to the chipset. So that's these four here that I've circled. Those correspond to the bus that is going here. Now the chipset does not support PCI Gen 5. The chipset connection is only going to run at Gen 4. So there's a little bit of weird, funny marketing that was going on before these products launched where they were saying, you know, you had 28 lanes of PCI Gen 5, four of which go to the, CP, uh, to the chipset, but the problem is the chipset only does Gen 4. So it basically cuts the bandwidth to uh, Gen 4 speed. So there is a little bit of potential bottlenecking going on there. It kind of makes it more in line with what Intel is doing with Z690. Uh, with their DMI interface for the platform controller hub. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions at any time, please feel free to, to leave a comment in the chat. Um, it, it, it can help everybody benefit because a lot of this stuff is, is obfuscated and hidden from the public. Um, you know, Asus, as much as I like Asus motherboards, I really, really, I'm going to knock them on really not being clear on not giving us the block diagram and, and me having to go and do the guesswork and draw it out here for everybody to see. Um, and even then, I don't know if this is 100% accurate. Um, but, you know, this is based off of what we know from what the chipset provides and what the CPU provides. So, I've kind of mapped out which USB drives go to the CPU. So, you've got a rear, a rear type C 10 gig port, you have three type A. 10 gig ports that are on the back of the uh, back of the motherboard and those go to the CPU as well. Um, you need to keep track of those because some of them go to the chipset so you know there is some uh, potential I don't want to say bottleneck because it's not really a bottleneck um, but it does determine you know total throughput potentially because you are using up CPU or you are using up chipset resources having to send signals like all the way up to the CPU through the, the two chipsets that are daisy chained. So, so it's very interesting stuff. You know, this is probably my favorite um, motherboard series, or I guess it's my favorite chipset. X670E is fascinating because I don't think I've ever seen a daisy chained setup like this in a long time. Like the last time we had this kind of technology, it was like 15 years ago uh, with Northbridge and Southbridge type setups from AM, uh, like socket 939, AM1, AM2, the really, really old Intel stuff. Um, you know, from like the Pentium 4 days and that sort of thing. So, it's really cool. Um, honestly, I feel like if they didn't kill off Threadripper and HEDT, and if they if they kept Threadripper uh, for mainstream, or not mainstream, but for like HEDT, I feel like this daisy chaining of chipsets would be completely irrelevant, and they'd probably be marketing B650E as X670. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting though. You know, I, I do like it. It's cool, but I, part of me wonders: was it really necessary to do it this way? Um, but you do get a lot of lanes. So all right. So now, if we look at the what, what I call the primary chipset, a lot of people might look at this and say hey, that looks like a Northbridge from you know 2005. Um, but essentially, you have a primary one. Now the primary one doesn't have as much connectivity. People are probably going to ask, people are probably going to look at this blog deck and they're like, the question to me is probably going to be, why Why is so much stuff wired down here um, so there's more latency having to go through you know, the middle chipset? Why can't it be, for example, wired up here? Well, the reason why that is, is because the primary chipset doesn't actually have enough lanes available for the breakout because if you look here in the top image so this is the this is the layout for the B650 chipset and remember X670 is literally just two B650 chipsets so you have four PCI Gen 4 lanes and you have four additional PCI Gen 4 lanes so that means you have eight PCI 4 lanes and then you have four more PCI lanes so total of 12 for the chipset. However, four of those lanes have to go to the CPU. So these four are actually the ones right here. 
So these can't be used to connect any peripheral um, via PCIe because they're, they're, they're forced to connect to the CPU. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, that means we have a total of eight Gen 4 lanes that we can connect to various things. So in the case of the ASUS X670E Extreme, uh, one of those would be the third PCIe uh, X4 slot at the bottom of the motherboard. So if you look at a picture of the motherboard, let's bring up a picture of that real quick. Let me get a picture for everybody to see. Uh, yeah, let's go with this. Copy that in. Let me just paste that over here so everyone can kind of see. Um, let me just put it over here, just in case. Okay, so on this motherboard, we have, you know, the top one. We have the second one, which is this one and this one. But we also have this third one down here. This third one is typically where you would connect uh, AverMedia capture card or an Elgato 4K capture card. That's where you would put it. You put it down here. You wouldn't want to put it in this middle one because that would make your graphics card run at by eight. So that's the one that's on the switch. You don't want to use that. You want to use this one. So this bottom one is a chipset uh, connected interface or PCI Gen 4 uh, and it's a by four. So it supports four lanes. So that's perfect for something like a Thunderbolt add-in card for instance, but we don't need that because first of all, this motherboard does not have a Thunderbolt 4 a header or a USB 4 header because it already has the Intel controller on the board and which we'll go over in a little bit so it already has the Thunderbolt you don't need that uh, and you don't really need Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi is already on the board so really the only thing that I can see going in here is either a single PCIe Gen 4 uh, expansion card for instance so that would be sold separately um, or more realistically because this is marketed to gamers content creators I really think that this is where you plug in your 4K capture card. So in my case, I would connect my AverMedia uh, 4K60 Pro capture card in here. Or if you have an Elgato 4K, you know, that's where it would go. So that's basically what we have right here. Um, so And that takes up four of the lanes. So if we go back to our diagram, that's taking up four of the lanes from the chipset. So that means we have... Uh, four more lanes and the CPU lanes. So we already know where the CPU lanes are, but the thing is these four lanes are not available because these four lanes are used to connect to the bottom chipset, to the second chipset. So, you know, that that's where that goes. So that I think that answers the question of why, why is there not a lot of I.O. on the primary chipset? And the answer is because it, you know, it's wasting, well not wasting, but it has to use eight of the Gen 4 lanes to connect to the CPU and then back to the south bridge, or I guess the secondary chipset. So that's why you don't see a lot of stuff connected in terms of like the 10 gig NIC and all that stuff. So all of that's going to have to run through the secondary chipset. So we come down to the secondary chipset. Well, actually, before we do that, um, it, these chipsets have PCI Gen 3. So you notice here I've drawn PCI Gen 3 bus on the right side. So that is what can be used for SATA or PCI peripherals. So that's what this is. So there's four of those available. So that's typically where your, your four SATA are going to be. Typically every single X670E motherboard is going to have at least four SATA ports. So if not more. And the thing is, I guess a total you can get up to eight SATA ports, but realistically you'll never see eight um, because if they go with eight natively, that uses up all your PCI Gen 3. So then you can't have things like, you know, uh, onboard LAN or, or Wi-Fi and those sort of things. Um, unless you do, unless you wire them up to PCI Gen 4, which can technically kind of be a waste of resources. So... The way that ASUS did it, or at least the way I think they did it, is I think that they used the PCI Gen 3 bus, so they took all four of these lanes and they wired those up to the Intel JHL8540 
USB 4 controller. So this is the Thunderbolt 4 controller, and it's on this motherboard. And I think that is part of the reason why this motherboard is so expensive, um, because it does have the Intel Thunderbolt controller. If they wanted to go cheapo mode, they could have gone with the AS Media USB 4 controller instead, but they did opt for the Intel-based Thunderbolt controller, or Thunderbolt 4, so it does have support for that. And that's where you're going to get your display out capabilities um, because they are leveraging the uh, the display out functionality of Thunderbolt and USB 4. So the display port alt mode is enabled for both of those uh, interfaces and I think they're both on the back of the motherboard. So, And I think they're using the PCI Gen 3 bus because if you look up the documentation, Intel's USB 4 or Thunderbolt 4 controller uh, is actually PCI Gen 3 uh, X4. So it's not Gen 5 and it's not Gen 4, it, it actually is Gen 3. So they can save a lot of resources by wiring up to the Gen 3 bus, which allows them to get that second M.2 uh, native PCI Gen 5 uh, slot on the top there to the CPU. So I don't know if this is how they've done it, um, I think this is, realistically, in my mind, this is the only way that they could pull this off. Because if they were to wire that controller directly to the CPU, I don't understand how they would uh, get a second native M.2 uh, SSD, like, off of the, the 5.0 bus. I don't know how they would have pulled that off if they had the Intel Thunderbolt controller wired to the CPU. So this is the way I think they've done it. Uh, but again, it would be really nice if Asus were to publish the block diagram. Okay. And you can see here they have a USB. They got four USB Type A's on the back. Uh, and then you have a USB 2.0 header for a uh, front panel or for you know anything like up to four USB 2 ports are supported. And that is from here you have that native on the chipset. And it's worth noting, both chipsets have, you know, up to six USB 2. So I don't know, maybe maybe what they've done for those last two SATA is they wired them to, they did some kind of conversion between the USB 2 header into SATA. I don't, I mean, technically I think you can do that because that's how, that's how, uh, now that I think about it, that's how external that's how external storage works. So maybe that's what they did. Maybe that's where those two SATA ports go. But I think they would have to use some kind of uh, either as media or some kind of controller to pull that off. But again, a block diagram would help and solve us all this trouble. Or save us from all this trouble. So anyway, um, that's the primary chipset. If we look at the secondary one, uh, you know, this one has now th this one, so the interesting thing is the secondary chipset, because it's at the end of the line here, it actually does have more, more connectivity options because, you know, it only had, four, only four lanes are used for the uplink. So that would be these lanes to the CPU. So what that means is you actually can wire up, you know, a total of eight PCI Gen 4 lanes. So what do they do? One of them is the second Gen Z 2.2 or 2 underscore 2. So the second drive that can go on that, what used to be what they called the DIM.2 slot, that's where that goes. So that's a PCI Gen 4 SSD. Um, and then they have the 10 gig uh, NIC. So they have the Marvell, I think it's the Marvell Aquantia. Uh, 10 gig. I don't know if it's a Quantia. I forget who. Maybe it is Marvell. Um, but they have a 10 gig NIC, and normally this is via uh, f a four lane PCI 3. But because they're able to wire up to PCI 4, they can shave off two lanes and uh, and save two lanes and use that for the Wi Fi 6E um, and the Intel 2.5 NIC. So you get dual NIC on this motherboard, all off of the PCI 4 bus on the secondary chipset. So it's really interesting how they've done it that way. Um, that's really the only way that they'd be able to do that, um, unless they somehow used USB for the Wi-Fi 6E internally, but I don't think they did that. I, th I think they somehow either put an NAS Media controller 
to wire up two SATA ports so they could get six SATA ports total. Those last two go via USB 2.0 interfaces. I could be completely wrong in, in my understanding of how that works, but I think that's the only way they could get that to work. Um, and the other thing too is if you look in the manual, it does say that the last two SATA ports, so SATA port five and six, they have a different naming convention compared to the, the first four SATA ports. The last two SATA ports don't support RAID at all. So I think that they are going through some kind of conversion, either like via USB interface or, um, you know, uh, some as media controller or something. But the thing is the as media controller doesn't have any lanes available to connect to. So I'm not really sure how they're doing that. Um, the only way to know for sure is if if somebody either watching this video, if the, if you have access to hardware info, if you if you're using an X670 Crosshair Extreme, uh, if you have hardware info, you can export via hardware info an XML file of all the mappings of the chipset, and that'll give you the full readout on how everything is wired. So. That would be one way to do it manually and try to figure out what really is connects where. Um, because a lot of this is guesswork on my part, trying to understand how this connects based off of knowing what the chipset supports. So the last thing worth mentioning, you know, you got a bunch of USB 3.2 Gen 2, you know, you have a 20 port to support 60 watts via the uh, PDQC connector on the board so that I believe that is wired to the chipset. I think both 20 gig ports as well as the 40 gig ports are all going through the chipset because there isn't really a way to get you can't you can't get 20 gig USB out of the CPU. It it doesn't support it. If you look here, the most you can do is 4 10 gig and a single USB 2. Now that single USB 2 is what they have the DAC connected to. So your onboard audio is connected via USB 2.0 on the CPU. I'm pretty sure that's how they've done it because I think I've looked at a lot of motherboards and I think that's pretty much how they've had this wired up. It gets you the least amount of uh, signal loss and that sort of thing going straight to the CPU via USB as opposed to going to the chipset. Uh, but it really depends on the motherboard. Uh, you know, you don't have USB 2. What they could have done is they could have put the DAC um, on the chipset and wire it up to like one or two of these. That's another way they could have done it off of the chipset. So I don't I don't know how they've done it. It's I've seen some do it on the CPU. I've seen others wire the onboard audio to the chipset. It really just kind of depends. I would say right now, in terms of documentation, ASRock is probably the absolute best. Gigabyte is second, like a close second, and ASUS and MSI are like you know they're, they're last because they don't give us the block diagram and I think the block diagram these motherboards are so expensive it's kind of ridiculous that we don't get the block diagram in the manual in fact most of these boards they didn't even come with the paper manual in them which was kind of ridiculous because you know uh, I think in the case of gigabyte gigabyte didn't, didn't doesn't have the manual and it doesn't even have a USB drive with the drivers um, Thankfully, that wasn't an issue for me. Um, I was able to get it up and running without any problems. But, uh, you know, like I've heard people who have the MSI Ace um, or, or the, the MSI boards in particular, those come with AMD Wi-Fi 6E. And I, depending on your version of Windows, if you're on Windows 10, if you're on an older version of Windows 10, it's probably not going to know like what that Wi-Fi 6E card is. So it's not going to know how to get the drivers for it. So it's not going to, it's not going to do anything with it, and you won't be able to connect to the internet unless you have a LAN connection. So most people that are enthusiasts probably do have a LAN connection. So it's probably not that big of a deal, but you never know. All right, so that kind of covers ASUS. Um, I don't see any questions. Let me do a test for the chat. Okay, so the chat's working, but no no one's commenting, huh? Surprise, there's no questions. Typically, people will have at least one or two questions um, on what they can connect in terms of connectivity.
All right. Okay, so let's uh, let's go over MSI. So MSI, we move this over. Um, let's do this. There we go. Okay. So with MSI, it's the same. same essentially, it's the same. Just put the board here in the middle. And then we'll, we'll bring up the, let's, let me get the, uh, the diagram. Yeah, this is super helpful. This thing from Tech Power Up. So the chipset layout and then also the CPU layout is worth, worth having access to as well. Because that does show you how many displays you can potentially connect to these motherboards. Okay, so this one we're probably gonna have to scroll down quite a bit. And again, I don't know where the where those extra SATA ports go. I think they're probably connected to USB somehow. That's the only feasible option. That would make sense to me. Okay, I think this is good. Okay, so this is the now we're gonna go over the ACE. So X670 E ACE. So this is the other big flagship motherboard that a lot of people, myself included, were interested in. This one is probably my my first pick in terms of if I had unlimited funding. Well, I don't know about unlimited funding because I'd probably get the godlike. Um, but if I was serious about going with a new AM5 uh, motherboard, this is the one at the top of my list. And we're gonna explain why here in a little bit. Now, the biggest thing to ding MSI on is the fact that they did not include this block diagram in their motherboard. If you go back and look at their X-Power Titanium from X370, they did give you the block diagram back in the day. So I don't know what's the problem with... Uh, and the other thing too was at launch, Asus and MSI, Asus was the worst one. They did not even put up the support. You couldn't even download the BIOS update on day one officially until like I think it was like more than 24 hours they finally upload that stuff to their official website the only way to get that was to go through some forums on ROG and get to someone who like a moderator that had access to the support uh, like the the, uh, the media fire download link to get the actual file it's kind of ridiculous on Asus's part I don't know what they were doing MSI almost as bad they didn't have their documentation published uh, at launch. Uh, props to Gigabyte and ASRock. As much as people hate on Gigabyte, Gigabyte did the, was probably the first one to have all their documentation online. I think it was up to a week in advance. You could go on Gigabyte's site before you could even buy the Oris motherboards, and they were already there. Like all the the manual was there. You know everything, all the support stuff, the bio stuff was all uploaded. So. Props to Gigabyte. The other thing too about Gigabyte is they actually uh, gave you the block diagram that shows where everything is for all three of their X670 motherboards. So it's kind of ridiculous that Asus being number one in terms of market share can't even include that. And then MSI also follows suit and can't include that, which is kind of sad because in my opinion, uh, I think MSI is the best one overall. Uh, in recent years, and then followed by kind of Asus, ASRock, and Gigabyte. Uh, but ASRock also did have very good documentation. ASRock and Gigabyte, they give you the full block diagram in their manual. So I don't have to do this kind of like smoke and mirrors case study work on trying to figure out what connects where for Gigabyte and ASRock because it's already there for the users. So so good job for at, to ASRock and Gigabyte. I just wanted to call that out because they did a really good job. And MSI and ASUS, shame on you. Especially ASUS not putting any of the stuff on their website until like a whole day and a half after launch. Um, so anyway, let's get into the ACE here. So this is still my top pick. I think this is the best motherboard um, for out of all the X670 motherboards. Yes, it's expensive, um, but it checks all the boxes. The only thing that this motherboard lacks is USB 4 and or Thunderbolt. So if you want Thunderbolt, you're going to want to go with either Asus or ASRock. 
Um, and if you can if you can afford to save money and and wait it out for the add-in cards for USB 4 to become available, then you could also go Gigabyte because Gigabyte does have the USB 4 Thunderbolt header on the motherboards. So Gigabyte does have USB 4, but just not integrated into the motherboard, whereas Asus and ASRock already do natively have the that support. So um, MSI is the interesting one because they completely ignored USB 4 and just opted to, you know, go tried and true PCIe lanes, just straight up lanes and drives. That's 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 it's old school, and I love it because this motherboard feels like an actual mainstream motherboard with a lot of like high end features. So yes, you don't have USB 4, but honestly, like in my case, I'll never really use USB 4. I think it's kind of redundant. I think like if you're, unless you really need the throughput to copy stuff between like external drives or something, I don't really see much of a use case on a day to day basis for that function. But you know, hey, if you need it, you know, the Tai Chi has an excellent uh, feature set for USB 4, and then of course the Extreme. But you know, if you wanna if you want to pay the ASUS tax, then you know you can have you can go ASUS or you can just get ASRock, which I think is a pretty solid option. So anyway, so if we look at the CPU lanes, the cool thing about MSI, and we'll break it down here for everybody to, to understand, but essentially remember what it shows here. So you have uh, 28 PCI Gen 5 lanes. Four of which connect to the chipset. So so it's more like you have 24. So that's the reason why AMD uh, markets it 24 lanes of PCI Gen 5. Because four of them always go to the chipset. So the four of them here are already going to the chipset. So that leaves 24. So if we want to do the math and figure out what connects where, we just add these up. So this is the PCI 5 bus. We have 16 lanes to the primary PCIe slot, and that would be the slot right here at the top. Uh, the second slot shares bandwidth via a PCIe switch. So if you populate this slot with something up to by eight, and the thing that would typically go in the second slot is the Aero Expander card that does come with this motherboard. So that allows you to add two additional PCI Gen 5 drives and those will be PCI Gen 5 native um, because the this is PCI Gen 5. So, but what it does is it splits this first set of 16 into eight lanes. So you get half of it going to the GPU and the other half of it can go to the M.2 drives or whatever you wanna put in this second slot. So that is what these are. And the total is 16 lanes. So, now we move on to the general purpose lanes for PCI Gen 5. And what MSI did is, I don't want to say they kind of cheaped out, but essentially what they did was just give you more, you know, M.2 and another, they, they, they gave you the M.2, uh, which is typically a requirement of X670. So, one, so this first one corresponds to a PCI Gen 5 M.2 slot. So if you do the math, that's this one right here. So that's gonna be your first, that's gonna be the top one right here on the motherboard. So that leaves you a second set of four lanes and a lot of different brands have the option to either give you USB 4 or they could have given you like Thunderbolt via Intel or they could have given you, um, you know, as media USB 4 um, or they could have given you another M.2 drive. So what MSI did was they, they, they got a little bit fancy. What they did was they actually wired up a switch. So they put in a PCIe switch right here. Um, and the options are the third PCIe slot. So the one down at the bottom. What that means is that this is going to be a Gen 5 interface. And it's four lanes. So that's really nice. And a lot of people don't really see how that's future-proof, but in a way that it, that really is future-proof because 
you have four pure lanes of PCI Gen 5 bandwidth that you can use with whatever add-in card you want. Um, so who knows? Someday, maybe there's going to be like an 8K capture card. You know, an 8K capture card is probably going to be PCI Gen 5 X4. Uh, if not, it would have to be, you know, at least probably PCI uh, 4.0 X4, and which this would support. So, you know, a lot of capability there. A lot of future-proof capability. I hate to use the word future-proof, but I can't really think of a better way to explain that. I mean, that it is what it is. So, I really like that. And that alone is the reason why this is my top pick. Because rather than give me USB 4, which I personally won't really use on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I think this is a lot more useful. So if you have a Avermedia Live Gamer, you know, like a 4K Pro capture card or an Elgato 4K capture card, you know, that's where you'd connect it in that bottom PCIe slot. So that gives you a lot of bandwidth. Um, the other option is they do have an Asmedia 3241 wired up to the switch and that does give you another 20 gigabit USB-C on the back of the motherboard. So on the back of the motherboard, that actually is, if we want to get a picture of it so people can see, let me uh, let's grab this and I'll just put it here for now or can, can we fit it down here? Yeah, okay, so we can fit it, we can actually fit it down here. So this, this USB port right here, the one that's turned sideways, this one is the one that's connected to that Asmedia 3241 controller. And that does mean that it goes to, up to the switch, and that does mean that it goes up to the PCI Gen 5 bus, which means this USB port is technically a CPU uh, USB port. Not, not, not uh, absolutely, because it does go through an Asmedia controller. Um, but it doesn't go through the B650 chipset or either the primary or the secondary. So it is worth noting. The only problem with that, the only limiting factor is if you plug in a an X4 card into that bottom PCIe slot, it will disable this port. You won't be able to use it because I believe I read it in the manual, uh, the PCIe slot has priority. So this is basically the primary on the switch and it will override, it'll turn off the, the uh, as media and, and therefore your 20 gig USB port or that particular one. So that's kind of how they're doing it. Um, you know, if you add all these together, you have 16 plus four, that's 20 plus four, that's 24. So there you go, that's your full 24 lanes of PCI Gen 5 on the MSI Ace or the Meg Ace. So I, I like the way they did it. it it's it's pretty good. It's not as convoluted as the Asus Extreme, um, but it's better than the Crosshair in terms of what they're giving you. Um, because the, the problem with the Crosshair is the Crosshair doesn't give you that extra PCIe slot at the bottom, which is a big deal breaker in my mind for such an expensive product. So like I was saying earlier, you know, hence why I feel like MSI's motherboard lineup feels like a real motherboard lineup. Like it has the, the expansion slots. It has the M.2 connectivity. It has the USB 20 gig and the 10 gig and all that stuff. So I do think that MSI did it right, um, but I do think that there is a argument to be made for USB 4 and Thunderbolt, which, you know, Asus and ASRock uh, did follow up on, on uh, fulfilling that need from the user base. So if we look here, so you've got USB 3 type A's, and then you have a USB-C that supports DisplayPort Alt mode. Um, the chipset, or the CPU rather, says right here that port 0, 1, and 2, so that would be these first three that I'm circling here, those support DisplayPort Alt mode. So what MSI did was one of these, I guess it's the first one, they went and took that and they're giving you that one on the back. The other three, these three, one, two, and three, they opted to go with USB type A so that you can p connect a lot of peripherals, you know, like a, a USB microphone or a DAC or some other, you know, keyboard, mouse, whatever. You want to have them connected to the CPU 
Well, there you go. That's your CPU USB 3.2. So that's those three. Um, and then the you have a single USB 2 that's wired directly to the CPU. That is typically where your onboard audio goes. So the ALC 4082 and the DAC, the ES 9280AQ, that's wired up via that USB 2 port that goes straight to the CPU. So that's how the CPU is allocated on the socket 1718 LGA for the Meg Ace. So if we move now to the chipset, so we have the primary and we have the secondary because this is a X670E. So you have two of these essentially B650 chipsets. Um, so if we look here, you know, we've got four PCI Gen 4. We have four more, so it's a total of eight. Then we have four for a total of 12, but four of those go to the CPU. So the lanes to the CPU are gonna go right here. And then you have to keep in mind that the primary chipset has to connect to the secondary chipset. So it does eat up four of these Gen 4 lanes. So that really only leaves four PCI Gen 4 lanes for the primary chipset. So the way MSI has allocated it is they have given us an M.2. So the second M.2 is a PCI Gen 4 drive, which for most users, that's going to be enough. So it's different from the way the Extreme on Asus went about it, where Asus, what they did was they gave you, um, you know, two, two native uh, Gen 5 M.2 whereas MSI gives you one but the difference is MSI is giving you four unallocated well essentially free Gen 5 lanes via an expansion slot but if you don't need that at this time they give you another USB 20 gig port on the back USB-C so I, I personally like the way that MSI has done it better than ASUS this time around. So I think feel like this is a little bit more flexible um, in terms of what, you, what you're able to do. Because ASUS, the difference is ASUS opted to give you another Gen 5 M.2. And as a result, you do not have the freedom of the four Gen 5 lanes for an add-in card. But what ASUS did give you is Gen 4 four lanes available on the extreme so so uh that's uh that's just something worth pointing out so here you have an as media uh 1074 for more usb uh and then you've got you your sata they have sata two of the sata drives do not support raid and the reason why those two in particular do not support raid is because they're wired up via an as media uh, 1061 in order to essentially daisy chain them so that they only use one gen 3 lane as opposed to two or one per sata because if we look at the map out uh, when it comes to gen 3 you you only have four lanes of pci gen 3 per chipset um, and those can be allocated to either a gen 3 peripheral or they could be generate they could be allocated to a sata drive so, um, in this case, if we look at the PCI 3.0 bus on the primary chipset, what they've done is they've taken one lane, so we'll just say this lane, and they've wired that up to an as media, and they give you two SATA drives. No RAID support, but they give you two on that, on that particular one. Then what they've done is they've taken another lane, and they've wired up AMD Wi-Fi 6E. This is actually AMD Wi-Fi 6E, not Intel or... Uh, Realtek or you know Qualcomm or anyone else or, or Marvell so they've taken one lane of the Gen 3 and they've given you an AMD Wi-Fi 6E uh, so AMD actually partnered with MediaTek there was a press release about this several months ago like back in the spring but essentially MediaTek and AMD partnered up and they made their own Wi-Fi 6E uh, NIC and MSI actually went and offered it in their motherboard I think as far as I know I think the others do have these as well. I know I know ASRock has some SKUs that have this. Uh, maybe Gigabyte on the the non E 
The X670 Aorus Elite AX might have this, uh, but I know the Master and the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme, those are using uh, Intel uh, Wi-Fi 6E instead. Um, but you know it doesn't really matter. I think I think the Intel ones you don't have to worry about the driver not automatically installing. I think I've heard stories of uh, people booting up the Ace board and they don't have the Wi-Fi working because Windows doesn't know what this thing is, so it can't download the drivers automatically. So you have to manually get them. But you know that's not that big of a deal. You know that's early teething issues with any brand new hardware. So um, and then you've got two lanes for two SATA drives so the SATA primaries those are those two all right so that takes care of the of course you get you know additional USB it is worth mentioning that all the actual 20 gig USB is actually via the chipset so this one the one that supports the 60 watt is connected to the chipset and there's probably another one yeah there's another one down here uh, via the back panel that supports the because the front panel one is on the primary I believe and the secondary one is on the secondary I don't know if that could be flipped I have no idea um, but uh, either way you know the 20 gig USBs are via the chipset except for the this one right here which is actually via the CPU over an as media on a PCIe Gen 5 switch so that's how you're getting your 20 gig USB so last but not least, we have the secondary chips. This is kind of like a south bridge. So this one offers more connectivity potentially um, in terms of how they're allocating stuff. So you do have a USB 2.0 header. So you can wire up like case, an older case or like a, you know LEDs or something that need USB. So USB 2.0, there's a like four USB. So that essentially is from here on the chipset layout so that would take those and on the 4.0 bus remember we have eight lanes total so what they do is they give you two more m.2 drives on the secondary chipset so that would wire up to this set of lanes and this set of lanes so that's gonna be your two m.2s on the ace Gen 4, uh, and then we have the 3.0 bus, this one, which in the case of the Ace, they have taken all four of those lanes, so that would be these lanes here, as far as I know, and they're allocating those to the Marvell Aquantia 10 gig NIC, so that's how you're getting your 10 gig LAN. The only thing that I don't know is where these other two, the secondary SATA ports come from. Because as far as I know, this, this requires four PCI Gen 3 lanes. The only other way they could have done that is to take two PCI 4.0 lanes. But because they're giving you so much M.2, uh, they don't actually have the ability to do that. So, yeah, I don't know how this is allocated unless they're using some kind of special as media controller that connects via USB 2.0 or 3.2 and then they're somehow able to convert it to support SATA that way the way an external SSD works for instance so maybe that's how they're doing it um, but I, I don't know how to illustrate that um, other than saying that it's connected via USB so that's it for these motherboards so they're very interesting stuff I'm not gonna lie like the the Meg Ace is probably my favorite out of all the X670E motherboards that I've looked at. Um, although the more I look at the Extreme, the more I kind of like the Extreme um, because it does give you a lot of connectivity. But it does have a lot of weird resource sharing that's going on. Um, and I'm not 100% sure how they're wiring up the, the Intel Thunderbolt controller. I don't know if they're using, you know, four lanes of Gen 3 or are they using it off of Gen 4 or if they somehow did it off of Gen 5. Then my question would be, how are they getting that second M.2, or I guess that third M.2 to work with Gen 5? So it's some kind of hocus pocus magic that Asus is doing with a lot of like PLX switches and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, I think that was pretty much all I wanted to cover on this live stream. Uh, I don't see any comments. So I'm surprised that I did see the viewer count go up. So we did have concurrent viewers that would drop in. 
Um, but apparently no one had any questions. So either either everybody knows everything they need to know about how these motherboards are uh, wired up, despite the fact that you can't find this info in the manual, or you can't see it visually in the manual. Um, but anyway, that's all I had. Uh, let me just go back real quick before we close out the stream. I'll just put the Asus one uh, back on screen here. So this is the Asus Crosshair. So you guys can see the difference in terms of how they've allocated the resources. So you do get that Intel Thunderbolt controller, which is pretty nice. But overall, you know, I would say B650 is going to be a lot more straightforward. And I, I anticipate less teething issues with B650. Because I know right now, at least in my case, with Gigabyte on the Aorus Master, there are a lot of issues with add-in cards uh, that are particularly going through the second chipset and going all the way up. So it is kind of uh, it's kind of buggy right now with memory and like system resume not working properly and add-in cards not waking up with the rest of the PC, forcing me to have to reboot the computer. It's really annoying. Sometimes a reboot or a warm restart doesn't actually redetect the card, so you have to either reboot a second time, and that usually fixes it, or you have to cold boot, and that's that's really annoying. And, and every time I have to reboot the computer, you know, you're you're waiting on, on that post, and the post is like 30 seconds at least. Um, and I'm not even running DDR5 6000, I'm running it at 5600 uh, on an Expo profile, and it's still taking me like 35 seconds to post on a Gigabyte Aorus Master. So, uh, yeah, I can, I can totally get why not a lot of people ran out on launch day to get these motherboards. Um, because the platform cost is really, really high. And, uh, the, you know, there's a lot of weird, uh, issues. So let me go bring back up the, the MSI. So the MSI board, so people need to see that again. So that's kind of the layout in terms of uh, what connects where. So hopefully this is helpful to people that were interested in getting either an MSI motherboard or an ASUS motherboard because you're probably not sure. Like you're probably coming off of some old X99 or or even X79 uh, or or maybe a third or first gen like an X399 or or even you know Skylake X X299. Because I do think that uh, even though these aren't officially HEDT class uh, platforms, I do think that for the amount of lanes that they give you, it is kind of equivalent to what Threadripper first gen was in terms of connectivity. Uh, but I will say, you know, at the end of the day, yes, the platform is expensive, but you know, so is HEDT. So I, I do think that B650 is really going to be where it's at in terms of people adopting AM5. In fact, I think B B550 or B650 rather, B650 is really more the true successor to X570. Uh, because if you look th like what we're looking at right here, you know, on the screen, this is a B650 chipset. And essentially X670 is nothing more than two B650s daisy chained together. This is B650, this is B650. They're not actually X670. There's, there's really no such thing as X670. It's, it's li literally two X670E equals 2XB650. That's really what it is. So it's like they took two of them, two of their mainstream chipsets, daisy chained together and call it kind of HEDT-ish. So it's essentially the way it looks to me. So in my mind, you know, coming off a of Threadripper first gen, uh, this doesn't seem like it's that expensive. You know, a lot of people are looking at it like, oh, it's so expensive. But, you know, if, if you had Threadripper, you're already kind of used to paying these kind of prices already. Like my my uh, MSI X399 Meg Creation uh, on th like paired up with a 2950X from, you know, 2018 like late 2018 and you know that computer is like four years old so it makes sense for me to upgrade to this because this gives me pci gen 5 you know potentially usb4 if i bought an asus or a or a uh, an asrock tai chi um so you know you, you get more forward compatibility you get more future proofing 
um, as cringy as future proofing sounds but you know it, it is a superior platform and the 16 core 32 cre- thread uh, CPU is uh, way faster than the the Threadripper 2950X that thing with its old NUMA versus UMA architecture and all those like latency issues that, that platform and both platforms support 128 gigabytes of memory the only difference is this one does it on four dims whereas the older one did it on eight dims so yeah in my mind it's a pretty nice uh setup like i i like it i definitely would look at an eatx motherboard uh, but for anybody that's on like first gen ryzen yeah i would wait for b650 it's probably gonna be less less teething issues and i wouldn't be surprised if b650 uh post a lot faster than x670 because i i think i don't know but i think one of the reasons why this takes so long to do memory training is not so much the IMC. I think part of it is the IMC in the early days because that's how Zen 1 was. Um, I think it's because there's two of these. That That's why. Because Threadripper takes a, a, a little bit longer to post than uh, a typical mainstream desktop. And the other thing too is Threadripper takes longer to wake from sleep. So I do think that the, the bugs that we're running into right now with this platform, you know, like the sleep, like doesn't it doesn't come out of sleep, error code 11, you know, you gotta re- reset the computer. Um, these sort of things, I think it's because the, what, when you put the computer to sleep, it's not doing it correctly. It needs more time to sleep the computer because there's too many, perif- like there's too much stuff with the two chipsets. I think there's like timing issues um, which are going to have to be fixed via a GISA updates and UEFI updates and that sort of thing. So, yeah, honestly, I do think that B650 is going to be a lot smoother in terms of the launch. And I think it's going to be a lot cheaper. So, um, yeah, if, if I was looking, knowing what I know now, after get, going through like the early days of, of X670E and the Ryzen 7000 launch, uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend B650 over you know any of the x670 unless you need the connectivity which in in most cases in for most typical gamers and that sort of thing i think b650 is more than enough uh this stuff is kind of overkill for pretty much 90 percent of the user base the 90 percent of the people that this is marketed to they don't need this stuff like it's just way overkill this is definitely more for like people that are coming off of like threadripper or old intel hedt so All right, well, let's see. It's 23 viewers, but nobody, no one has any comments. I'm surprised. No one has any comments. We've gone through like two, two different motherboards. So we first covered uh, the Crosshair Extreme. For those who are joining the stream now, we, we've already covered ASUS. We were covering MSI. We don't need to cover ASRock or Gigabyte because they already give you all you need to know about the motherboard block diagram. So they've done an excellent job, both of them, especially ASRock. ASRock's documentation looks very wonky and confusing at first, but if you rotate it 90 degrees, uh, everything makes sense. Like they show you, they show you everything. Uh, in fact, maybe I can show that on screen. Hold on, let me let me pull that up. We'll probably go over that. Probably go over Azrock briefly. Let's find the user manual. Okay, so I do have that. Let me move this over so I can share. There we go. Okay, so let me zoom in. Or actually, let me just go straight to the block diagram. So I honestly think that this picture, this page in the manual from ASRock is so helpful on so many levels that I think every, every motherboard 
manufacturer should provide this in the manual. It saves so many headaches. It answers so many questions uh, about what you can and cannot do, what's supported, how many dr M.2 drives can you raid at you know Gen 4 or Gen 5. You know, it answers all the questions. It tells you if it has Intel USB 4. It tells you if they're using a as media USB 4. Um, ASRock even went so far as to tell you if the port is on the back or the front of the motherboard. Like if it's a front panel connector or if it's a rear a port on the back of the I.O. That is so good. This is why ASRock being such an underdog, it's amazing how the underdog actually has the best documentation and the industry leader, aka ASUS, has the worst documentation. Go figure. I mean, it's so weird how that, how that turns out like that. Um, and then Gigabyte, the one that everybody hates on in recent history, I don't really know why, um, has almost exactly as good as, as, uh, as ASRock. The only, the only difference between Gigabyte and ASRock is ASRock takes it one step further and tells you if the port on the primary chipset is on the front of the PC or if it's on the back I.O. of the motherboard. Gigabyte doesn't show you that. Giga, we'll, we'll look at Gigabyte as well. Gigabyte, uh, let's go find their stuff. Let's show Gigabyte's manual. Okay, wait, that's not it. I don't know why they don't put the manual at the top. That's kind of dumb. But anyway, here's Gigabyte. So Aorus Master. Just skip straight. There we go. This is this is very good. This is very nice. This is very well illustrated. So Gigabyte did a very very good job. It shows you you know where the the bottom PCIe slot is. Where's the other one? Uh, what the lane allocations are? You know where the SATA drives are? Which chips that they're connected to? You know where's the Wi-Fi connected? Where's the 2.5 gig Intel NIC connected? Etc. If there's a PLX switch, you know, are the M.2s native or are they going through some kind of weird controller? You know, it really, really nice if Asus would provide this, especially on their $1,000 Extreme, because uh, it would have saved me a lot of guesswork. But yeah, props to Gigabyte and ASRock for going above and beyond and providing this info. Because the cool thing about ASRock, here we go Intel, USB 4, Maple Ridge. On the motherboard, it answers the question. Because I remember uh, when I went to Micro Center on launch day, I, ha I, ha I almost got into an argument with one of the sales guys about the, like telling them that the Tai Chi has Thunderbolt 4 on the motherboard. Or USB 4 is on the motherboard. Like, they didn't believe me. I'm like, yeah, no, the Intel controller is actually on the board. And here you go. The proof is right there in the manual. So, you know, that guy was like, oh, the more you know, yeah, that's good. That's good to know. Because, you know, now as a salesperson, you can answer your customers' questions about which one has Thunderbolt. So, as far as I know, I don't think this is officially, like, verified by Intel. I think that's the only limitation. I think Wendell from Le Level 1 Techs, I think he did a video about that. Um, I think he did. I'm pretty sure he covered uh, the Tai Chi. Um, but, yeah, so... So if we go over ASRock real quick, you know, so you can see like the way, the way they've allocated the Gen 5. So remember what I told everybody before, you have 24 lanes of Gen 5. So 16 of them are going to the primary graphics card expansion slot. And then you have a second one, which is connected via a PCIe switch plus read driver. So they've got a read driver. I like how they define everything. In plain English, so it's so easy to understand, although it does look pretty messy at first glance. Um, so it, it even tell you, right? Like, this is going to be X16. Or if something is in here, like, for example, uh, an M.2 expansion card or something. Or, or if you're doing, like, Crossfire, dual GPU, or whatever. Um, you know, this one's going to run it at 8. And then this one run it at 8. So it's very straightforward. And then just like the requirement for uh, AM5... For one of the M.2 ports needs to be Gen 5. So there is your Gen 5 SSD port. That's the one that has the huge heatsink on it. Uh, so that's 
16 plus 4, that's 20. So you have four remaining lanes, and like that tech power-up article said, motherboard manufacturers have a choice of either giving you another M.2 or giving you USB 4, which is what ASRock has done. You know, they could have done that either via Intel, like they've done here, or they could have done it via Asmedia. So they opted for Intel, which is totally fine because I think Intel's driver support is actually better. So uh, there's your Maple Ridge, and that gives you two USB Type-C ports on the back. These are the ones that are going to have the Thunderbolt Lightning Rod Arrow, uh, and they're going to support the display outs. You even tell you right here, Display Port 1, Display Port 2. So Display Port Alt Mode is going to travel over to USB 4. They also give you an HDMI port. So you have, and this is the, and I, I like how they go even further and they tell you the mapping, the port mapping. So for instance, DP0, this is the primary display out, the first display out. Then you have a second one and a third one. So you can literally run three monitors off of integrated graphics uh, with this motherboard. There's your flash ROM for a BIOS. ESPI to LPC bridge. I'm not sure what this is. I don't know what this controller does. So that, that might be the platform secure processor. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and then you have a you have two USB 10 gig ports on the back. And it's rear, so those are on the back. So it's probably type A because they don't specify. So then the remaining four lanes go to the chipset. If we look at the chipset, so you have the Gen 4 bus, which has the second M.2, and they also tell you that it supports SATA, so you can do SATA off of that. Uh, and then there's a quick switch. If you see here, they tell you there's a quick switch. That's interesting. Because see, this is the sort of thing, like what they're showing you here on the right, this is the sort of thing that would confuse me for so long. I have such a hard time drawing this out in paint. Like, what? how is this actually wired? So it, this saves so much guesswork um, and, and just answers so many questions. So basically what this is saying is that if you put a SATA-based M.2 in this drive slot, because this supports PCIe or SATA, then the switch will disable this SATA port. So SATA A3, A1 will be disabled if we connect a SATA, an M.2 SATA drive in that port. So that so this ties up all your Gen 4 bandwidth on the primary chipset. So now we have four Gen 3 lanes. So one of them is going to one that has media. That's the one that has a switch. So there's two SATAs off of there. And then there's another one that, that gives you two more SATA ports. Uh, you have Wi-Fi, so the Wi-Fi 6E is taking up one Gen 3 lane, and then the last Gen 3 lane on the primary chipset goes to the Intel Killer uh, 2.5 gig NIC. So the cool thing about this board is uh, they've what they've done differently from what I've seen on a lot of other motherboards is they actually put the networking on the primary chipset. I've seen a lot of boards, particularly Gigabyte, where they put the, the networking stuff on the secondary chipset, which I don't know if that makes it that big of a difference. Um, I personally would, if I was designing a motherboard, I would actually probably put it on the second chipset because the way I see it is the network. The network side is basically last mile, so that's going to hit to the transport layer. So everything that I need to happen locally on the computer, so like all my file transfers via uh, SATA or uh, NVMe or uh, that sort of thing, like file copies, any sort of thing that's going to happen locally, I'd rather have all that connectivity on the primary as much as possible. And the networking stuff can go out the second chipset. So I would have done it differently than the way ASRock did it, but you know this, this is unique and it's well documented. You know, it, they tell you here on the left side, we're not going to spend too much time going over the USB, but you know, your 20 gig USB uh, front panel, you got rear 10 gig USB, uh, you got another one. I like how they give you the numbers 20 gig, 10 gig, 5 gig, 5 gig, USB 2, 
uh, the Realtek audio is on USB 2. See, they, they basically make it so plain English easy to, to understand where everything is. So then you have your final chipset at the bottom here. So your second B650 chipset, which two B650s together equals X670. So you have, again, you know, rear, rear USB ports, front panel USB connectors, front panel USB 2 connectors, um, and then you have your SATA. So remember, the four lanes of PCI 3 can either be PCI 3 or they can be SATA. So what ASRock did is they opted to give you all SATA. So they give you four SATA off the secondary chipset. So that's going to eat up all of the PCI 3 bandwidth. So you have nothing left. Uh, and then you have eight, eight PCI Gen 4 lanes on the second chipset that are free for whatever they want. So in this case, they gave you f two more uh, M.2 drives. What I would have done differently, uh, this is a really good motherboard, but what, what I would have personally liked to see is a switch um, where they give you either the last M.2 or this could have been a, a third PCIe expansion slot, an X4 at the bottom of the motherboard. I think that would have made this like a, a home run bestseller in my book if they would have given you that. Because... The, my only negative aspect of the Tai Chi is the lack of that third PCIe expansion slot at the bottom of the board. They literally only give you, you know, the top two that are Gen 5. And as soon as you plug something in, the second slot, your graphics card is going to run at by 8. You know, so, and I don't really like that, you know. As much as that's not really going to matter too much, I still don't like having it to share resources like that. That's my only negative aspect about this motherboard. But overall, this is a very feature-rich motherboard. For $500, you know, this is a really good upgrade for anybody who's on an old Intel HDT platform like Skylake X or Haswell E uh, or, or first-gen Threadripper for AMD. Um, you know, this is a very, very nice motherboard to upgrade to. Lots of stuff. USB 4, Thunderbolt, uh, you name it, it's got it. So... Really solid motherboard and very, very good documentation on ASRock's part providing this. So this is, this is the best block diagram documentation that I've seen so far. Um, so let's move on to Gigabyte, unless there are any questions in particular over ASRock. If anybody has any questions, uh, if you're watching this now for the first time or if, if anything comes to your mind like USB, PCIe, what, what, what can I do, what type of drives, etc., memory gpu whatever feel free to like put a comment in the youtube chat and i'll answer it if there aren't any questions for asrock then we're going to go ahead and move on to the last one that we're going to look at this today which is going to be uh, uh gigabyte because gigabyte's the only one i haven't covered but I, I do i am very very impressed with tai chi like the only thing like i said is the lack of the by four PCIe? They could have done that over here, and given you like a switch, where if you if you plug something in, it would turn off this uh, M.2. I think that's all they had to do, and it would have been like perfect. Um, very good motherboard. Solid nine out of ten, because it's pretty much everything except that one thing. All right, so let's move on to uh, Gigabyte Aorus. So this one, we're going to be looking at the Master, unless you guys want to see the Extreme. There are, interestingly enough, the Master and the X670 Aorus Elite AX uh, it are very similar in actual uh, PCIe allocation. The Extreme is actually a little bit more different because the Extreme has 10 gig LAN. We might actually look at the Extreme. So we'll, let's look at the master first, and then we'll look at the extreme just to compare them. So this is actually the motherboard that I personally am streaming on right now. So I know a lot about this motherboard. This is probably the one that I understand the best. Um, so this is the Aorus Master. Uh, so the nice thing about it is it does support USB 4. The only downside is there are no native ports on the back that give you USB 4. The only way to get USB 4 is to make use of the PCIe X4 slot down at the bottom there um, and using that Thunderbolt header that does, that does uh, come with the board. So if we look up here, 
uh, I'll just draw everyone's attention to this. So this is the Thunderbolt, aka USB 4 header. So it does support it there. So I just wanted to call that out because people are probably thinking that uh, ASRock and ASUS are the only options for Thunderbolt 4 or USB 4. And that's not true. Gigabyte does support it on the Aorus uh, Master and the Extreme. And I, I don't know if the Elite has it, but I'm, I think it does. Maybe, mm, not 100% sure on that, but I know the Master and the Extreme have it via the, the header. Uh, but you do have to use an add-in card. And I really think that uh, the, the add-in card doesn't exist today, but I feel like if they're going to do a revision of the Extreme, uh, I think they should include that USB 4 add-in card uh, because, you know, MSI is giving you the expander on with the Ace and the Godlike, and then Asus is giving you that Gen Z add-in and, you know, a bunch of other stuff too on the Extreme. So I do kind of think that Gigabyte is... In terms of features, Gigabyte is running a little bit light on features. Um, but their, their boards are relatively uh, more cost-effective than Asus and MSI this time around. So, and it makes sense because they are kind of lacking in terms of the features out, out of the box. So if we look at how these resources are allocated, so you have your PCI Express 16 up here on the 5.0 bus. So we have to do the math, and I like how they, they lay it out really easy. So 16... Plus 4, that's 20. Plus 4 more, that's 24. So there you go. That's your 24 lanes of Gen 5. One of them is for the graphics card slot. That's take 16. Then your remaining 8 each go to two different M.2, which both support Gen 5. So the this first one here is going to be the one with the giant heat sink. That's going to be the one that goes right around here. Um, and then the second one, this one is going to go under the plate which is going to be the second one right here. So those are both Gen 5 capable. And they're native Gen 5. There's no no switch, no as media, no controller, none of that stuff. It's straight up wired directly to the Gen 5 bus, going straight to the CPU. So that's really nice. Uh, very straightforward. Uh, if we go down here, you get an HDMI 2.0 and a DisplayPort 1.4. So you can run two monitors out there. They do also include a USB Type-C with Gen 2 support that has DisplayPort 1.4 alt mode. So you can run a third display off of that uh, that port provided you have a uh, DisplayPort to USB Type-C cable. They have the codec for your onboard audio. That This interface, they don't actually tell you what the interface is, but I know for a fact that it has to be USB 2.0 um, because the, if you go to Tech Power Up, you have a USB 2.0 in gray on the CPU. So that's going to be where your onboard audio is. Most of the time, not all the time. Like in the case of ASRock, ASRock actually opted to wire it up via one of the USB 2s on the chipset. So they don't always have to do it that way. So still no questions. Wow. So the chat's very, very quiet. We had like three viewers, concurrent viewers, and no one had any questions. Okay. All right, you get a USB 2 hub for two USB ports. So those are going to be the, the black USB type A ports on the back of the motherboard. You get two USB Gen 2 type A. Um, I wish they, the only thing I would criticize them is I really wish they would tell you on the block diagram, whether or not the ports are in the front or the back, like are they on a header or are they on the rear I.O.? Because uh, ASRock does that and that's that's what puts them one step above Gigabyte in terms of documentation. Um, but, you know, this is still this is still very good. This is still better than, than MSI and ASUS, like miles ahead. Uh, so one USB Type-C, okay, we've already covered that. You get your ITE Super I.O. Um, that's going to be the BIOS. And then you have a TPM. Okay, so primary chipset, pretty straightforward. You get a single M.2, so this is going to be the third M.2, this is going to be Gen 4. And the reason why this is the only thing that goes here is because if we remember, again from Tech Power Up, we have a total of 12 sets of four PCIe lanes each. Four of them are the uplink to the CPU. And then four of them have to connect to the secondary chipset. So that means you only have four 
free to wire something up. In this case, they're giving you an M.2 drive. So your PCI 3.0, in this case, all four lanes are allocated to four different SATA drives. Um, and then you have, again, more USB connectivity here, including the USB 20 gig Type-C port. All right, and then finally, the, the lower, the bottom chipset or the secondary chipset, I like to call it Southbridge, but basically this is the one where what they've done is they've they've given you an X4 PCI 4.0 slot. So that's really nice. This is where you can put like an Elgato 60, uh, 4K60 capture card, or in my case, an Avermedia uh, Live Gamer. Uh, you know, those sort of things would go here. You could put in an add-in card for a single M.2 drive, but honestly, these things already have four, so I, I don't really see that as a, a use case. Wi-Fi doesn't make sense because Wi-Fi already is included. Um, and then you have your final uh, M.2 drives for a total of four M.2 drives. So we have two Gen 5 M.2s and we have two Gen 4 M.2s. So that's going to be your eight PCI 4 lanes. And then you have the PCI 3.0 bus. And what they've done with this is this is where they've given one lane to Wi-Fi 6E and they're using Intel Wi-Fi 6E, I might add, um, whereas MSI was using AMD Wi-Fi 6E, which is a newer chip. But the Intel one is very, very good. So we're not going to knock it for that. Definitely not, because Intel's networking is pretty solid. So then Intel 2.5 gigabit NIC. So I, I like that too, because that's better than the typical, uh, you know, um, real tech stuff that we've seen in the past. Uh, and then you have, what's interesting here is they put a switch. So there's a PCIe switch, uh, which gives you a third PCIe expansion slot. But for some reason, it's they say it's X2. So it's two. I've never heard of a uh, two electrically for PCIe. Typically, it's, it's X1, X4, X8, X16. I don't think I've ever heard of an X2. So I don't even know how that would look in terms of the pinout. But that's really interesting. Um, and then the other option is two additional uh, SATA. So there's a switch. So the la so the you get four SATA ports or f four SATA yeah four SATA ports uh, for your uh, you know like spindle drives or old SATA based uh, two and a half inch SSD drives um, or even an optical drive. Um, but they also give you two more. So a total of six. Um, however, I believe if you plug in something into the expansion slot, uh, like an X1 add-in card or something, that will disable both of those SATA drives, those ports. You won't be able to use that. So, so it's really more like four, four absolute SATA drives and then like maybe two extra. Uh, but SATA is slowly phasing out. Um, I don't see myself actually, when I think about it, you know, so I think one of, the, one of the criticisms I noticed from reviews of these motherboards, people were criticizing that, you know, like six SATA wasn't very much, or if there was only, if there were only coming with like uh, four SATA drives, like some didn't even give you the switch. So it's nice that they give you a switch um, for the extra, but you, they, you know, SATA used to be like eight SATA in pretty much every motherboard. Um, but now we're down to like six and eventually I think it's just going to become four, uh, and then it'll probably become none. I really do think that B650 is going to be limited to, um, four SATA drives unless they do something fancy, like put a switch like this. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what those B650, uh, block diagrams look like. We might actually look at one after this, but I might have to take a break, um, because I've been uh, talking for a while now and, uh, yeah, it's... It's, it's, it's interesting stuff. So, for sure, it's fascinating. So, I guess the only other thing I'll say is... Well, that's really all I had to say in terms of the, the connectivity. I, I do think X670E is fascinating. Like I was saying at the beginning of the stream, uh, this is probably my favorite chipset. As weird and convoluted as it is to figure out what connects where, um, it is uh, very, very fascinating. Uh, let's try to find the, let's look up the X or B650E Aorus Master. Let's see if Gigabyte actually has, oh, they do. See, this is the thing about Gigabyte that's really good. Like their, their manual, their manual is already available for B650. So let's go ahead and take a look at the B650 just for comparison's sake. 
Okay, so see, so this is what I was saying earlier. Like, this, to me, looks like... This looks more like a traditional, like, almost like X670, like last gen. So, if you look at this, you get... I like how they're giving us a lot of Gen 4 expansion cards. So, if you see, you have uh, a switch for your primary graphics slot. So, you have the X16, or it can be a uh, by 8 and then you have two two M.2 drives and then you have two more M.2 drives. So basically all of the M.2 all of the M.2 on the B650 motherboard is directly wired to the PCI 5 bus. So it's interesting how they've done that. So what that means is as soon as you plug in a an M.2 drive in M2B or M2C, you're instantly going to run your graphics card at X8. So that, that is the reason why this is definitely a more budget-oriented platform. Because there's a lot more... Uh, well, not, not really a whole lot looking at this. But there's potential for, for uh, compromising on your graphics card slot. In terms of how many lanes are allocated to it. But it's nice to see that you still get the 24 lanes of PCI Gen 5. And this is B650E. So B650E means you get Gen 5 to the CPU. If there's no E, I think I think that means that there's no Gen 5 PCIe bus. So, very cool stuff. In fact, the more I think about it, when they say when they say PCIe everywhere uh, for the X670E Extreme, I don't even know why they would differentiate it that way. Because uh, well, anyway. I'm just going to go off on a tangent. I don't want to do that. So, uh, real quick, looking at this. So, the, the USB 2 uh, has the audio. You have an HDMI port. Uh, you have... It looks like you do not have any other display options besides that single HDMI. Uh, and then down here in the chipset, you have the 4.0 bus. And you're still going to get your 3.0 bus. But all the PCI 3.0 lanes are allocated to SATA. So all so you get four SATA drives. And it looks like you only get four SATA drives. That's what I was saying earlier, remember? I was saying that I expect there to only be four SATA ports on the B650 motherboards because you don't have the luxury of the double chipset. So you can't uh, you can't use like as media controllers and stuff like that to alloc to reallocate lanes. It's just not enough. So they have eight total for the Express 4.0 bus, what they've done is they've taken four of them and they've given you a PCI Express uh, by four and then another one by two, and then M.2 Wi-Fi and then Intel Gigabit. So that total is, uh, this is two, that's six, and then seven, eight. So it gives you all your PCI 4.0 lanes. So pretty straightforward, pretty simple to understand. Definitely not nearly as confusing as X670E. But anyway, guys, that's that's pretty much it for this video. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave a comment regarding any of the info that we went over today, and I will be sure to respond when I can. Um, but if if no one has any more questions, I'm gonna head go. I'm gonna go ahead and end the stream here. Uh, thank you for viewing, and I will catch you guys in the next one. Thanks.